we basically got to this picture where I can now choose an irregular curve, um, so a triple sigma a and theta, so maybe having a collection of points and an irregular class of rank n at each of those, um, and this gives me a wild character variety. Um, uh, so MB um, so this is the space of Stokes representations uh, divided by some reductive group H. Um, so we get this algebraic Poisson variety for each choice of a irregular curve. Um, and then we can choose, um, so we basically have a choice of data like that that determines the Poisson variety, and then we can look at the symplectic leaves um, we can choose a class, let's say C, in the group H, or in general in some twist of the, the, the group H, and we get this symplectic leaf MDC. So this will be the symplectic um, wild character variety of this irregular curve um, given by the choices at the start. Um, so we kind of have this, this, this vast class of spaces and there's lots of different things we can do. We can try to re repeat all of the games that people have played in the Tame picture in the past, um, noting the fact that we now have this much larger cl class of choices. We don't need to pick the Tame irregular class. We can choose any number of these circles, this infinite number of circles at each of the mark points um, together with multiplicities. Um, so I just wanted to sort of go through a list of different things that one, one can do, um, and in particular focusing on the quasi-Hamiltonian perspective that was kind of our aim, but I want to mention different perspectives also. Um, maybe not completely in depth because we're slightly short of time, but just to point to various to different things which are known. Um, let me just make a remark to start off with. Um, that I'm sweeping under the carpet various technical changes that we made to the standard picture. Um, in particular, we're constructing this by quotienting by a reductive group. Um, so I just wanted to remark that we get to this because we use framings um, at a po po point, or uh, so one point at each boundary. And the standard um, story in the Stokes data business is to use what they call a marking. And a marking is basically a choice of isomorphism between your whole formal normal form and a standard formal normal form. And so that involves going around the whole of the circle. And in general, the group of automorphisms is the group of automorphisms of the formal normal form that won't be reductive in general. And so by passing to this picture, we're able to get the quotient by the reductive group and therefore construct a affine algebraic variety. Um, so not markings. Um, so we always get um, uh, quotients by reductive groups. The group of automorphisms of the framing is a reductive group. So even if we started out in the G version of this, so taking G to be an arbitrary connected complex reductive group, H is still the centralizer of a torus or a levy or equivalently the levy of a parabolic um, in a product of copies of G. And so we um, um, are always quotienting by reductive groups. And so uh, I just wanted to mention that, how it differs slightly. So if you look in the work of Babbitt and Varadjian, there's a bulletin of the AMS sort of um, uh, statement of their results, and they get to this problem in the example at the end of their paper there, and it's also um, repeated in their main book on irregular collections from, I guess, the 80s or so. Um, okay. So now let me move on to the, the quasi-Hamiltonian picture that was sort of our main aim. Uh, so the statement was that this had a algebraic Poisson structure and we got to this because the, the space upstairs, the wild representation space R, 
um, had the structure of being a, a quasi-Hamiltonian H-space. So I wanted to say very briefly what that is. I mean, it's, sorry. Yeah. Uh, do you some notion of stability and semi-stability? Yeah, so here we're just doing the affine quotient. So in effect, all of the points are polystable when we're taking those. You can look at the characterization of stability, and that is done in the paper as well. Um, but I'll skip over that. Here we're just looking at the affine algebraic quotient, and that's taking the um, polystable points. Um, uh, so the closed orbits, the set of points of the affine quotient is the set of closed orbits. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this quasi-Hamiltonian uh, setup. Um, this goes back to this paper of Alexei of Malkin and Mine Renkin, um, but it's building on work of various different pe people. In particular, the first example of a group of values moment map is due to Macduff in the case of a torus, um, and the main one of the main classes of examples is the conjugacy class, and that has a particular two form, um, and that was in the work of Lisa Jeffrey, um, who looked at extended moduli spaces, which are very close to this, but the extended picture is still working the usual Hamiltonian picture. It's not completely multiplicative or group values, but the main example actually occurs there. Um, and others. It's also coming out of the work on Hamiltonian loop group actions of uh, Donaldson and Meinrenken and Woodward before. Um, okay, so I don't think it's particularly helpful if I dwell too much on the axioms, but let me at least just state them. That um, So a quasi-Hamiltonian G space, um, so it's a, a space M having an action of the group G, um, and then we have a two-form and a moment map. So omega is a sort of G-invariant two-form. Um, and mu, the moment map, is a map that goes from M to G. And this has to be G-equivariant with the action of G here and the conjugation action of G on itself. Um, so we get this, and then there's three axioms, um, which are the sort of multiplicative or slightly more complicated version of the axioms of a Hamiltonian G space. And so um, the first one is like the analog of the symplectic form being closed. It says that the uh, exterior derivative of uh, omega is the pullback of the canonical three form on the group. Um, so if I look at theta is you know, G inverse TG, look at the third power of that and take the, the trace um, and divide by six. That's the standard three form which is on the group. Um, so omega does not need to be closed, but its derivative has to be the pull back of this standard three form. Um, and then there's conditions like the moment map condition. Um, so if you have a element of the Lie algebra of the group, uh, then there's a condition that omega of Vx um, contracted with, yeah, so omega of Vx is related to the moment map in a particular way. There's, so you get half of the pullback of theta plus theta bar, so the left and the right invariant Mora Cartan forms um, paired with x. And so the brackets here are a fixed invariant inner product on the algebra. So here for GLN, let's just take the trace. Um, and then there's a minimal degeneracy condition, um, which is the analog of a symplectic structure being non-degenerate. Um, you put in that the kernel um, of the two-form at a point M in your space intersected with the kernel of the kernel of the derivative of the moment map has to be equal to zero, which is a point of the tangent space to M at M. Um, so these are complicated axioms, and you, um, this is actually a simplified version of what was in the original paper. It was, it was understood that one could write this simpler condition. But the main point is that we can then wo wo work wi with these and have operations um, and end up with symplectic spaces. If the group is trivial, this is just saying that we do have a symplectic form. Uh, so we'll look at you know, sort of multiplicative symplectic reduction as a way to construct you know, genuine symplectic spaces, where if I just take the straight quotient, I'll get something which is um, Poisson. 
Um, so one basic property is the fusion product. Um, so if I have a pair of spaces M1 and M2, you take the fusion product, which as a space, it's just the product of the spaces. Um, and then the moment map is just the pointwise product of the moment maps. And so that's um, so it's from M to G. So if this is M fusion of the ones I had before, and there's a formula for how to get the, the multiplicative symplectic structure on here out of the two symplectic structures on the pieces. Um, you basically take the sum and then add on a fusion term. Um, so the main example of these is the um, moduli space of flat connections on a, a punctured surface. So for us, that's the representation variety of a surface with one marked point with the tame class. So that's just the, the space of representations. Uh, let me write this hom pi one sigma O of the punctured curve into our group G. G. Um, Can you say again what the fusion product is? I'm sorry. So of the spaces, it's just the product of the spaces M1 cross M2. And then it has the, the moment map, which is the product of the, the moment maps before it, in a particular order. Um, and there's a formula for how to get the two form from the two forms here. Um, and the action is just action of G, not the square. action is the diagonal action of G, yeah, yeah right. that's right. Um, all, all of this is sort of standard quasi Hamiltonian stuff. So the main examples of quasi Hamiltonian G space bases are these, as I mentioned briefly before, and the map is just the um, so mu is equal to the, the monodromy around the boundary, and I'll choose the base point on the, the boundary, so that's well, well de defined. Um, it, 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 and the action is the action by conjugation, which corresponds to ch changing the framing. I mean, so this is a, a moduli space of framed local systems. Um, so when you have it in this picture, I thus have a, a surface. For each surface with one boundary circle, I thus have a quasi-Hamiltonian G space, the space of flat connections or representations of fundamental group with respect to a chosen ba 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 base point on the boundary. So if I take this to be my space M1, and then I have a different surface here, um, the fusion product of these, so that will give me M2, the space of flat connections there, then the fusion product is indeed the, um, the space, so it's why I glue the circles together, and I again end up with the surface having one boundary, um, and we take the space of flat connections on there to be M, um, that, that, that is the product of the spaces here, and the, the um, moment map here will be the product of the moment maps which I have there, and the forms are cooked up, um, so that the form which is here is indeed the one that comes from the fusion of the forms we had b before. We get this ring structure on the category of quasi-Hamiltonian G spaces. Um, and uh, uh, one question just to make sure I understand. Is, so the fusion product happens automatically if I have two M1s and M2 with U1 and U2 satisfying this action? Yes. Okay. Um, that's right, you get another quasi-Hamiltonian space out of these. So the game will be to just have some simple pieces and then get complicated surfaces out of the simple pieces. Um, that's the way the proofs of all of the, these things pr proceed. The next operation is reduction, um, which just corresponds to capping off. So M, so if M is a quasi-Hamiltonian G space, I look at M double slash G, which for me will mean the multiplicative symplectic reduction, so mu inverse of one multiplied by g, the, the multiplicative or group valued version of the Marsden Weinstein symplectic quotient. Um, and this will again be a, well, so in ge general, I might start out with this being a quasi Hamiltonian g cross h space, and I just quotient by g, this will be a quasi Hamiltonian h space. So I, I kill the part of the action which I quotient by. So in particular, if H is the trivial group, I will end up with a quasi-Hamiltonian space here for the trivial group, and that's just a symplectic manifold. Um, so this is symplectic. 
um, if H is trivial. Uh, and in general, it's a quasi Hamiltonian H space. Um, you can also just look at the um, reduction, so M modulo G. In this algebraic perspective, you're looking at the ring of G invariant, the, the variety associated to the ring of G invariant functions on M. Um, this will be an algebraic Poisson variety. Um, and if you have an action of G cross H, it'll end up in some sort of quasi Poisson space, space. But let's just look at the case if M is a quasi Hamiltonian G space. Um, it's an algebraic Poisson varieties in the symplectic leaves are mu inverse of C modulo G for conjugacy classes C in G. Um, so we have this one way to create lots of um, symplectic and Poisson spaces like this. So the picture in terms of the surfaces is just by capping off. So we end up with a surface with no boundary and we take the space of flat collections on there So the picture, if I had an M which comes from a particular a surface, um, so if this was M, then uh, I cap off, I glue here, I'd end up with a surface, and this is you know, M, uh, symplectic reduction by G. This, putting the moment map being equal to one means that you're killing the monodromy there, and that co co corresponds to capping off. Um, Okay, it's handy to define gluing as well. Uh, and if I have an non-trivial G extension of G by H, yes. it's not a product, but G is already the biggest I can, so it's not product caps. No, I only look at products. So it's a, okay. Yeah. So I, I was wondering if I could get um, a synthetic manifold with symmetry still. So if I have a product, I can, and that's the only okay. case I'll look at here. Um, gluing is just, um, so M1 glued to M2 is just the fusion and then the reduction. So in terms of pictures, um, it's just that I glue them together. I have M1 and M2 and I do there. So in effect, I fuse and then cap off the extra boundary which is there. Um, that's just a consequence, but it's useful to do like induction with respect to the order of the pole um, using that symbol. Um, but I may not get, get that. That's in the, the papers. Um, okay, so the basic examples. Um, so firstly, you have the conjugacy class See the inclusion of the conjugacy class in the group with the group acting by conjugation. This is the multiplicative analog of a co-adjoint orbit in the dual of the, the, the algebra. This is a quasi-Hamiltonian G space. Um, there's a formula for the two form that comes in this work of Lisa Jeffrey before we sort of knew the definition of what a quasi-Hamiltonian space was. Um, yeah, so basically, I'll not write down the expressions for the two forms. You'll need to look in the papers. I'm sort of cutting some corners. So then there's the double. So D, um, I just take an annulus or a cylinder. Um, so this is like the representation variety of P1 uh, with two marked points and tame, um, which is just the representation variety of a cylinder. And this is isomorphic to an annulus like this. Um, so I choose a base point on each of the boundaries. And so this is just isomorphic to the product G cross G. And the moment map goes to G cross G. I have the change of the framings. It's a quasi-Hamiltonian. Um, this will be a quasi-Hamiltonian G cross G space. Um, and the moment map mu is something like if I have C and H. Uh, you can do C, H, C inverse, and H inverse, something like this. I think the convention I have is to put C inverse there. Um, so this is just a choice of certain paths. You know, so I have a C, C which goes like this, and I have an H which goes around. 
Um, it's a certain choice of generating paths in the fundamental groupoid of this with two base points. Uh, how does this uh, interact with the homomorphism theory? Like, so this should be a quasi-classical version of it. You're supposed to quantize this to get that. So do you, do you, in homomorphism theory, would you take uh, markings instead of spanning? Because uh, so if, if you if you take Tibble Skinny, for instance, so. Right, there's this Hamiltonian loop group perspective where you're framing on the whole of the circle. Yeah, and you have an action of the loop group there. And in effect, to get from the Hamiltonian loop group perspective to the quasi-Hamiltonian perspective, you're choosing one of the points on the boundary and you're forgetting the rest of the framing. You're quotienting by the base loop group. This is explained in the Alexei of Malkin and mein Blinken paper. Um, and so there's a way to get from the Hamiltonian loop group perspective to um, this quasi-Hamiltonian space. And they prove for compact groups it's equivalent. Um, so what we have is some new examples of like, well, um, extension of this a tier bot perspective, and that can sort of give you new kind of Hamiltonian loop group spaces. So you then want to push that down to get algebraic quasi-Hamiltonian spaces at the bottom. And we computed those and then proved their they're quasi Hamiltonian, which gives these new examples that we'll get to. But I don't think much work has been done in the purely loop group perspective. It's more that we're working on you know, sort of gauge th theory on the whole curve. Um, and we understood sort of what conditions to put at the boundary to get you know, symplectic or complete hyperkähler metrics. Um, and now I'm talking about you know, the algebraic part of that, which is possible to twist and push, push down to get you know algebraic, uh, quasi Hamiltonian, and then symplectic or Poisson spaces as well. Um, that's the story. I mean, that's spelt out in this Duke paper from you know, a decade ago or so. Uh, this is on the archive in 2002. Uh, uh, but the recent part is more how to extend from the generic picture there to the general Stokes picture, having these much more complicated spaces of Stokes groups and the twists as well in this paper with Daisuke. Um, so there's this double, which is the space attached to an annulus, and then you want to look at the space attached. So this is the internally fused double. Um, so this is the space attached to a one-hold elliptic curve, if you will. And so this is a quasi-Hamiltonian G-space. Um, and so again, you have mu from G cross G now to G. And this is just you know, the multiplicative computation, you know, A, B, A inverse, B inverse. And you can get to this by, by fusing the two ends of the um, annulus together. So if I have this and I fuse um, like this, I end up with a one-hold sphere. That's the reason it's called the internally fused double. Um, this can be derived from the double at the top. And the double can actually be viewed as a conjugacy class of a disconnected group. And so in fact, all of the examples go back to conjugacy classes, but that was not understood in the first papers. Um, okay, so you get some pieces and then you can just fuse all of these together to construct the global spaces and prove that they have these quasi-Hamiltonian structures and then you can reduce to get the symplectic structures on the moduli spaces. Um, so... So if I look at the full Tain picture, I have this surface with some marked points, and I do this real-oriented glow-up, and I get this surface with, say, M boundary components. I look at the fundamental groupoid. Um, so this is the fundamental groupoid of sigma O with respect to this collection of M base points, one on each of the boundary circles. Uh, so probably I want to do this sigma hat here, um, the real-oriented glow-up. Um, so the same is that this will be a quasi-Hamiltonian G to the M space, um, and you can prove that by chopping up 
the surface, it's isomorphic to, so, so suppose I have a surface of genus G, then we take this internally fused double and we fuse G of those together. Uh, and then if we have M marked points, we also put in, so this is the usual D uh, like this. Uh, we take M of those and then we reduce uh, by one copy of G. Um, so I still have the action of the G to, to the M c coming from the other end of these doubles. Um, I still have these three, um, these M holes. Uh, and so this it is a quasi-Hamiltonian G to the M space. Um, simply from the action of G on each of the other end of these annuli or, or cylinders. Um, so you can draw a pic pic picture of the fusion of these and see, see that that's what you get. And so that gives this space here a, a structure of quasi-Hamiltonian G to the M space. Um, so a consequence of this is that um, you know, MB equals R mod G to the M is an algebraic Poisson variety. Uh, and MBC is symplectic. Um, this is the reduction. So this is our symplectic reduction at C by G to the M for C in G to the M, a conjugacy class. C class. And you can get to it directly just replacing these Ds by the C C C Cs here. The, the, this is isomorphic to the internally fused double G times fused with like C1 fused up to Cm, the M conjugacy classes, which are the factors of this C in G to, to, to the M. Um, it's an basic quotient by G, which is the quotient which we did there. And so there's this nice algebraic way to get these, um, these kind of well-known, I mean, there's lots of different constructions of this algebraic Poisson structure, and th this is just the um, the one which I understood the best in order to be able to extend it to the irregular case. Um, so in order to extend this, we need to know the local space that happens at an irregular pole. And we mentioned that briefly at the end of the last talk. Um, but once we have that space there, we can just replace the annuli that we had here by the annuli which occur as a um, irregular pole. Uh, so we get these fission spaces. Um, so basically now we're looking at R attached to, so globally you would take P1 with one mark point, say, um, I don't know, infinity with an irregular class, and then you take A with a tame class there. Um, so in effect, if you look at the real oriented blow up of this, you've just got a, um, sorry, let me put the, the irregular pole at zero and the tame pole at the infinite point. Um, so we have um, this picture, so we have a halo around zero, um, and we have these singular directions and all of the structure that we talked about there. We'll choose a base point also here, which will have some group H, the graded automorphisms of what occurs, and there'll be these tangential punctures. Um, so we just take the Stokes representations with respect to these base points, HOM S pi G. Um, so this is you know, sort of sigma tilde, so this is the subset of the real oriented blow up where you've taken out these tangential punctures and you're taking pi to be the fundamental groupoid of that, sigma tilde, with respect to a base point near each of the boundaries. So here we would just have two. Um, so once I understand this space, I can then just glue this G boundary into the surface just as before. In effect, I'm generalizing the annulus that we had before to have a wild end as well. Um, so we need to prove, um, so this is a 
is a quasi-Hamiltonian. Um, so in general, it will be a twisted quasi-Hamiltonian G cross H space. Um, and you can easily compute what it is. It's isomorphic to sort of G cross H partial cross the product of the Stokes groups. Um, so this is like the product of sort of D in A of Sto D. Um, continued using a certain convention <coughs> to the fiber at the base point. Um, so I just have an, a reductive group GLN, a twist of a reductive group here, and here I just have this product of you know, concrete unipotent groups, and so it's clearly a, a smooth affine variety. Um, and it has an action of G cross H. Um, so I'll call a point of this C, H, and S. Um, and then you just compute, so C will be something like we have before, and H is around here, and the S's are just the um, monogamy around these tangential punches. Um, so mu is like mu G comma mu H, and mu G is a C inverse H. The products of all of the S's, so I'll put in a product, and then C and mu h is just h inverse. The generalization of what we had before with the double, but now we have these extra Stokes factors, these Stokes groups, um, and we're restricting h to be in a smaller group like h rather than g when we looked at the double. Um, but apart from that, it's precisely the, the same, and that's because we have, you know, we've generalized the picture we had before because we've understood this reduction of structure group or the twisted reduction of structure group and the, the um, tangential punches. Uh, so the action, uh, G cross H action, um, so you basically, in the interior parts of here, you're just conjugating diagonally by H, um, and then you're also acting by G on the outside here, and so it's something like you know, G of C H S is equal to C G inverse H S. And if I have something like, you know, if I have K in the group H, um, so let's just look at the group H at one particular the pole. So C H S at the pole um, will be, uh, so you know, how am I doing this? H, you know, K. K, C, and then K, H, K inverse, K, S, K inverse, acting diagonally on all of the Stokes matrices. And you'll repeat that at each of the poles if we have more than one pole. Um, so it's possible to write down a two form that we computed by starting from this infinite conventional picture and prove this. Um, so there's this suite, I mean, this was pr proved in 2002 in the generic case. And then there's this paper in the Malgrange volume in 2009, the simplest non-generic case. Uh, non-generic. And then there's this thing on the archive in 2011, I guess it was published in 2014, the complete untwisted picture. Um, and then there's this in the archive in 2015 with Yamakawa. Um, this is the general picture. Um, all of it, the, the, this is actually pr proved for arbitrary reductive groups. Um, so once we have that, we can just repeat what we did before and just replace the annuli that we had before by the spaces A. And so now the space of Stokes representations, um, so pi now is the fundamental groupoid after you have these tangential punctures. Um, so you just have an A for each of these, like theta one, and then we just fuse with respect to G um, all the way along to A and then theta M. Um, and again, we cap off this N reduction by G. Uh, so this now becomes the auxiliary curve like this. Um, and so what is the statement? Yeah, I think the same as basis as before, but let me re write it. So. Um, so here I have an action of H1 acting still, and here I have an action of HM. Um, so, so this is 
a, a twisted quasi Hamiltonian uh, H space. So just the product of the groups. Um, so this is a subgroup of G to the M. The grading gives this reduction of structure group. Um, so we have explicit two form and we've pre previously obeyed the axioms and so we can plug it in and do this fusion and reduction and so that gets a, a structure of algebraic um, quasi uh, twisted quasi Hamiltonian H space and the consequence of this is that we have the Poisson space as before so R modulo H is an algebraic Poisson um, algebraic Poisson variety um, and these M, B, C and M, B are the symplectic leaves. Um, so for C contained in this H partial, uh, these are twisted, twisted conjugacy classes. Um, so in the untwisted picture, they're just conjugacy classes in H. Um, in general, you're looking at the conjugation action of H on this twist of H, and you're just looking at orbits of that that people call twisted conjugacy classes. Um, and you can get this equivalently as D um, fusion G times, and then you fuse on now, there's a notational problem here. I'm going to define C hat 1, C hat M, which is G, uh, where C i hat is just A, um, and I did, did do the reduction at sort of C i by H i. So A has an action of G cross H i, and so it has this H boundary and a G boundary. I just want to fix the conjugacy class of the H monodromy to be in this class C, which I fixed up he here. So th this is a product of sort of C1 to CM. Um, so I just look at the reduction of A here. So this is like the, the, the higher pole order version of a conjugacy class that we had in the tame picture. This is just a quasi-Hamiltonian G space. So that corresponds to fixing the irregular class plus the formal monodromy as well. And so I'm basically fixing up everything which I can at the boundary at the middle, and I've just got this action at the end, um, and that gives this quasi-Hamiltonian G space here, and you can just fuse the, the, those together to get the symplectic leaf di directly. Um, so there's various sort of slightly different symplectic or multiplicative symplectic quotient constructions to, to do that. Um, Okay, I'm now tempted to switch over and talk about the additive picture, where we have additive analogues of each of these spaces, A and C hat. Um, there's also a space B, which is the quotient at the other end. Um, if I cap off the G end of this and just have you know, a sphere with one irregular pole and nothing else, I'll get B is like, you know, so, so B of theta is A of theta, um, multiplicative symplectic quotient at one by G. So in effect, I'm, I'm capping off this sphere, um, so I just have the one irregular the pole which I could put at the infinite point. Um, and these spaces turn out to be important as well, but it's not immediate the obvious, but that's what I'll call B, and we looked at an example of that yesterday, the case with just one, one marked point on the sphere. Um, Okay, I mean, there's a. a uh, is this picture reasonably clear what I'm doing there? That, that, yeah. Okay, maybe there's a few short things I'll just mention first whilst we're here. And then. So we constructed these new spaces like A and B. Um, and we saw that we can f 
fuse and glue those together to get these you know, spaces, you know, this topological description of the spaces of algebraic connections on an arbitrary curve with arbitrary singularity type. type. But the, the name fission comes from the fact that we're actually you know, reducing the structure group. So you sort of accidentally get this much larger class of spaces. If I just glue these pieces together arbitrarily, um, I get a much larger class of spaces than the one we actually wanted to construct. And I call these fission varieties. Um, we just look at all of the simplectic spaces, um, so got by the fusion and reduction um, of these pieces that we, we, we have, so of like A of beta, um, and the conjugacy class is C. Um, there's also a, another space I want to switch over, the, the tame fission spaces. Um, if you understand the Levelt filtrations properly, um, and Simpson's extension of those, and the G version of that that I looked at, um, there are these tame fission spaces. So basically it's, it's G cross a parabolic quotiented by U. Um, there are certain spaces which have to do with the tame filtrations at the poles. It should not be confused with the Stokes filtration. So you can look at all of the spaces which occur by looking at you know, fusions and reductions of these. This is a quasi-Hamiltonian G cross L space, um, where L is the Levy sub subgroup for a choice of a Levy subgroup of the parabolic P. Um, so the main picture to draw is the picture that we had before, but we draw it more. So we have a G boundary here. So we're just drawing the same annulus that we had before. We have a certain ha halo. Um, so suppose we've got, say, I don't know, GL of A plus B here. Um, and suppose H is GL A cross GL B. So some near block diagonal subgroup with just two blocks. And so the theorem says that we end up with a quasi Hamiltonian G cross H space. So here we have an H connection for this product of groups. So in effect, the two pieces of the surface are completely independent. I can glue on a GLA surface and a GLB surface. And so the picture is perhaps more that I have, you know, an um, so let's say this is H1 and this is H2. I have an H1 boundary there, and I also completely independently um, have an H2 boundary there. I do, do have a quasi Hamiltonian G cross H space. Um, and this is equal to G cross H1 cross H2. So in effect, I have a G boundary and an H1 boundary and an H2 boundary. And now I'm free to take an arbitrary you know, sort of H1 surface here and glue it on there, or I could have you know, several pieces like this and glue them into pictures. I mean, this is where the name fission comes out of, that this structure of having an irregular pole gives you a way to break the structure group, and then at least topologically, you're completely free to glue these arbitrarily. Um, this was first sort of understood in this paper in 2009 for the Malgrange volume, and there's a picture of having you know, three spaces like this with a, a sort of a, a, um, a genus one curve glued on there. If you take three and have GL A plus GL B and then B plus C and C plus A, you can get this closed surface, um, and it says that this will be a simplexic variety. Um, just straight out of this, you know, fact that we have this quasi-Hamiltonian formalism. And so we get this vast cl class of other um, complex symplectic spaces beyond the spaces that we actually wanted to, to construct just by observing that we are breaking the structure group and these are, um, you know, genuine quasi-Hamiltonian spaces. Okay, let me just quickly mention the additive picture because this gives the motivation, really goes back to what Riemann, Hilbert, and Birkhoff were, were, were looking at. The fact that there's a, a matching between the dimensions of the spaces, between these additive you know, spaces of connections on the trivial 
a bundle. Um, I'll call this like global leaf theory. Um, so basically, if you look at a connection like A, D, Z over Z, um, and you take the monodromy of that, you get an element of the group G in G. Um, so just by looking at a, a tame connection on a, a disk, um, taking the monodromy of that gives the exponential map like that. And we're basically wanting to replace this by an arbitrary rational matrix of one forms. Um, and so we're looking at like gl global versions of um, the, this map. And so here we have an arbitrary, um, yeah, so matrix of, of one forms. And then you take the Riemann Hilbert Birkhoff map, and there'll be some wild character variety which is there, and this will give you a point of that. And it's often possible to pick spaces of these such that the dimensions match up. And it's that fact that, you know, sort of Riemann and Hilbert and Birkhoff were interested in the fact it's possible to write the down spaces over here. Um, so I'll call this like new going from M star to M B, our, our wild Betty space, or they should probably be called Birkhoff spaces, but nonetheless it fits in with this motivic picture to call them the Betty spaces. They do behave the same way. Uh, okay, so I want to get to the symplectic description. description of M star. So this basically goes back to this paper in advances in math 2001. If I'm slightly sketchy here, um, and it's been extended to the arbitrary irregular classes, at least the untwisted picture. Uh, so basically M star is a space of meromorphic connections on the trivial bu bu bundle over one. Um, so e.g. the tame picture, I would just take OI in G star, so just a co-adjoint orbit of GLN, I'll take an M tuple of these, OM, and look at the symplectic quotient by the constant group G, um, and I'll interpret a point of this as a Fuchsian system. So this is a, a moduli space. This will be, be my M star in the tame picture. A point of this is an M tuple of motive AI in OI, such that, so it's this usual Hamiltonian reduction. The moment map will be the sum of the inclusions. So you take the sum of the AIs is equal to zero, and then you quotient by diagonal conjugation by G. Um, and a point of this we relate to the connection nabla is d minus a, where a is the sum of these ai's over z minus ai dz. So this is a quite standard picture that goes back to Schlesinger for the you know, space of Fuchsian systems, but it has this natural symplectic description like this, which is probably first due to Hitchin, but it's kind of clear. Um, so the moment map being equal to zero says that there's no further pole at the infinite point, that I've just got these m holes here. Um, and then we'll take the, you know, the monodromy of this. This will map to the tame character of varieties, which as we just saw in the genus zero picture, this is just the fusion um, of M classes CM quotiented by G. So this picture is really clearly the multiplicative version of that. And this fact, the sum being equal to zero now becomes the fact the product is equal to one. Um, this works provided the AIs are non-resonant, that the difference between any eigenvalues is not a positive integer. Um, so we have this family of maps like that, and this is clearly the multiplicative version of that. And basically, Birkhoff pointed out that one has this matching of dimensions more generally <coughs> in the irregular picture. And it's kind of easy to see sort of what are the symplectic structures to put on the additive side. Um, so yeah, what about like, uh, the Bollinger yeah, well, that's kind of like, you know, saying that the exponential map is not always surjective. So for SL2C, the exponential map, map is not surjective, nor is this. Um, but nonetheless, there's lots of very really good things which are true, and we want to sort of play with those. Um, 
So like, you know, this is like sort of my Lie algebra, or the analog of Lie algebra, and this is like the sort of the analog of the Lie group here, the multiplicity of the additive picture. Uh, it's slightly unfortunate that we have this star for the additive picture, but nonetheless, that's the notation that we use for this. Um, so the irregular version, maybe I'll just do the simplest untwisted picture. Um, so the, yeah. Um, so what we want to do is look at orbits oi, let's just say o, in gk star. So we define this group gk of k jets of bundle or morphisms. This is like g of cz mod z to the k. Um, and so the Lie algebra of this is gk is things which look like, um, so x is x0 plus x1z plus up to xk minus 1, z to the k minus 1, and you just truncate. Um, and then you could look at the dual of the algebra of this as being the principal part of a connection having a po po pole of order decay. Um, so it seems like a is a k over z to the k plus the residue term a1 over z uh, dz. And if you take the product of two such things and the residue and the trace, you get a pairing between these two, so it is natural to think of this as the dual of the algebra of what we had before. And so in particular, it has a natural Poisson structure, and we want to fix a co-joint orbit of that. So this is a GK orbit in here. Um, and it's the exact analog of what we did before. Um, and so we can put these together and view such expressions as the principal part of the, the i -th pole, and so we get lots of symplectic spaces of connections. And so what one can ask, is it possible to get a matching of the dimensions between these and the multiplicative picture that we had before? So e.g., if we look at the ones which are very good, it's not clear what the, the name is. So we want to fix um, an untwisted irregular type. Um, so we fix Q, which is some diagonal matrix uh, Q1 up to Qn, uh, where Qi is just an untwisted irregular class of uh, Cz inverse. So at each pole, we want to fix a Q. So we get Q1 up to Qm. Um, and we want O to contain an element that looks like dQ plus lambda dz over z. Um, so lambda will be a constant matrix, and without loss of generality, you can take it to be in the Lie algebra of this group that commutes with Q. And so lambda can be in this group H, which is the Lie algebra of H, and H is just the centralizer in G of Q. So the things that commute with all of the coefficients, and so this is something like you know, AI over Z to the I, um, where these AIs are diagonal matrices. Um, so this is just the subgroup of things that commute. It's some block diagonal subgroup. So for Q ge generic, H is a torus, and for Q equal to zero, it's the group G that we had before. Um, so there's a list of spaces. So um, if we do this, then th things work. But one can match up slightly better than that. We can get these extended spaces also. Um, so basically, O is the additive version of what we call C hat, but there's also something, the extended orbit, O t t tilde, and this will be the additive version of A, and so this will be a, so in the multiplicative picture, it's a quasi-Hamiltonian space, in the additive picture, it's a Hamiltonian uh, G cross H space. Um, and the moment map for the H here is the, the lambda, which is occurring there, and then you can reduce on the other direction as well. We get this thing OB, um, and this is the, the additive version of B. And so within here, you get this Birkhoff subgroup BK. Um, so this is the G such that G of 0 is equal to 1, um, uh, the Birkhoff subgroup. And so OB is just a co-adjoint orbit of BK. Um, so this is a BK co joint orbit. Um, so there are definitions of all of these. And, um, so this will be a quasi-Hamiltonian or a twisted quasi-Hamiltonian H space, and this is actually a Hamilton 
Newtonian H space um, from the action which is here, who has moment map equal to the, the lambda. Um, so at the end of the day, you get back to the picture that we had here. We, we can do the direct reductions by these O's with the d deep order of the poles, or we can um, pass up to the framed picture and then look at the reduction by H afterwards. Um, maybe I'll just mention some applications of this. I had planned to go through a list of examples, but I'm not sure if I have time. Uh, maybe I should. Anyway. Um, so, e.g., uh, yeah, maybe I'll just quickly go through these sort of examples and then. Yeah, maybe I should mention here, so OB uh, OB is a co-adjoint orbit of a unipotent group. So this has global Darboux coordinates. Um, and so we understood that quite early on. Um, and we understood more recently, or I understood in about 2008, that this can be viewed as the space of representations of a quiver um, on so, some vector space. Um, so we know abstractly it's isomorphic to some vector space, and we know that we get the wild, uh, the, the additive space is M star by some reduction by some block diagonal group H. Um, but this matches up precisely with what's happening in the quiver world. Um, and so this fact implies that M star is isomorphic to a Nakajima quiver variety of some graph gamma. Um, so for instance, if only one pole. Um, so these are spaces which occur quite often in re representation and so, so we have this, um, this moduli th theoretic interpretation as moduli space of connections. And it's important because if you look at the, the moduli space of complex dimension two, the graph which is occurring here is the same as the graph which is occurring in Okamozo symmetries, the affine Dinkin gra graphs which occur there. So for instance, for panel of A6, the graph would be affine D D4. Um, the point is that all of the panel of A equations have a lax pair that just has one pole, and so it, it does fit, fit into this picture, and it's possible to understand the graph in this way. Um, this isomorphism was proved in general in the non simply laced case in this paper of Hiroe and Yamakawa um, in 2014. Uh, Okay, so that's, you know, at least I've mentioned the link to quivers there. That, that, uh, it's basically how I'm spending most of my time these days, but I wanted to talk about some earlier facts as well. Um, so let me just go through this list of examples. So basically, if you look at rank one, um, okay, so, so, yeah, so we have this thing about admissible deformations. Um, so we have this irregular curve. If we look at a family of these over a base B, um, we can define what it means to deform the irregular class in an admissible way. Well, to deform the curve, you want the points not to coalesce, the curve to stay smooth, and then the, there's a condition on the irregular class that um, um, basically if you take each root um, and apply it to Q, then the pole order of this order of this is constant. So this puts in certain hyperplanes in the space of deformations of the irregular type Q. Um, and so you can say, well, if I have an admissible deformation, a family of irregular curves, which is an admissible deformation, then I can replace each of the fibers by the corresponding wild character space. I get a family of wild Betty spaces over the, the the, um, 
um, the, the same base. Um, so the fact is that well, the theorem is that this is a, a local system of Poisson varieties. Poisson varieties. Um, so just fixing a particular curve, we have this Poisson space. If you vary the irregular curve in an admissible way, um, the clutching ma maps which occur are you know, algebraic po Poisson automorphisms. And so in particular, um, the fundamental group of the base um, acts on any particular fiber, MB, of some particular curve in the family um, by algebraic Poisson automorphisms. And that's the, you know, the geometric way to obtain all of these Poisson braid group actions on spaces of Stokes data, which extends the well-known well tame picture, the action of the mapping cl class group on spaces of representations of the fundamental group. Um, that's the sort of general statement which occurs. And now this example, if I do rank one, um, then basically if you look at rank one connections on an arbitrary genus curve with arbitrary order poles, um, this gives you the theory of Baker functions. Um, so these are known to give solutions of Kp and Kdv, and the basic point is that the times which occur there, you know, the times which occur in the Kdv hierarchy, um, this matches up with the irregular deformation parameters, um, the irregular, irregular class deformations. Um, that's just a different way to say what people actually do, but it's perhaps not often understood as an example of an isomorphism deformation. Um, the next class to have a look at is just perhaps the simplest case of Q is um, just has one simple pole and I put in a, a sign and so A is just some diagonal matrix like this. Um, so in effect I'm saying I have an irregular class which is something like the sum of 1 to n of some constant a over z. Uh, so I have this and I have something to be tame at infinity. So it's as if I'm looking at a connection like a over z squared plus b over z dz. Basically the simplest irregular case which occurs if you go back to this global Lie theory picture. Um, then it's possible to compute what the Stokes directions are by projecting the roots. Um, so basically you'll get the A here is something like G. Uh, so let me look at the generic case where A is in T reg, so they have distinct eigenvalues. You'll get something which is isomorphic to U plus cross U minus. Basically here you'll, you'll get the product of all of the root groups. And so th this is a space of di the dimension equal to twice the, the, the dimension of G, um, and in particular A modulo G is isomorphic to T cross U plus cross U minus is a Poisson. Um, it's a Poisson space and it still has an action of T. Um, so this is the space that you're supposed to quantize to get the drinfeld jimbo quantum group up to a cover. Um, so this is G0, um, which is this dense open pass of G of the matrices in this um, you know, Gauss factorizable way. Um, and this has a double cover, which is this group G star. And you're supposed to quantize this to get UQ of G. Um, so there's a precise statement in Drinfeld's ICM note that the quasi-classical version of that is this dual Poisson Lie group, and this is proved carefully in these lecture notes on quantum groups like De Concini and Precesi. There's an in integral form of this such that you take Q to be equal to one to get this algebraic Poisson variety which is there, and one can understand the non-linear Poisson structure as the Poisson structure which occurs on this very simple space of Stokes data like this, and the the isomonogamy deformations quantize to give the so-called quantum vial group action, which is an action of the G braid group on the quantum group. And the quasi-classical version of that was computed by De Concini, Katz, and Bracesi. And I proved that it matches up with the isomonogamy action here. Uh, 
This is explained in some paper at IMRN in like 2001. That's a quite old fact, and that sort of m m motivates to have a look at all of the rest of these um, Poisson varieties which occur. Um, but yeah, there's an en enormous class of examples. Maybe I'll just draw a few pictures at, and then stop. So, for instance, uh, uh, suppose we just look P1 with one point, and we have something like in the regular class, we sum from 1 to 3 of Ai x squared. Um, so the connections will have a pole of order 3, so x is a coordinate on the plane, and so it has a pole at the infinite point. Um, so the analog of the diagram that Stokes drew will be this, this atomic diagram that people draw, something like this. And so you can compute what, what all of these Stokes directions and the singular directions are, and you'll end up that you'll find that the dimension of MB of C is equal to 2, and it's actually isomorphic to the, um, the panel of A4 wild character variety. And so you can think of it in terms of its standard sort of Garnier lax pair, um, but it also has this lax pair having a, a pole of order 3. Um, and the diagram of this um, is just the tri triangle, um, which appears out of this picture quite easily also by looking at the, the Stokes arrows and then taking off the relations which occur in this product b being equal to, to 1. Um, then you might look at you know, the, you know, the H3 surfaces. Um, so this is the space of the dimension C is equal to 2, which is basically the panel of A spaces um, plus these platonic spaces. Uh, spaces. Um, so these, yeah, these are to do with like E8, E6, seven and E6, and these are sort of degenerate versions of those. Um, so basically there's 11 deformation classes of complete hyperkähler spaces which occur that are sort of non-compact versions of K3 surfaces, and so we call them H3, sort of because we've got these H's, like, you know, sort of um, Higgs, Hitchin, and Hodge, because they are moduli spaces of Higgs bu bu bundles, um, they're also spaces of solutions of Hitchens equations, and they're sort of non-abelian Hodge spaces also, so it seems a pity not to use the names which are there. Um, so at the end of the day, you get this um, t t table, uh, which I guess was first detected in the panel of A picture in this work of Sakai. So you get the E8 space, E7, and then E6, and then you look at the degenerate the versions of this, so you get panel of A6 is affine D D4, all of these ought to have hats on. Um, and then you get sort of D3, which is A3. D3 affine is panel of A5. And then you get the three. Um, so panel of A1 is A0. Panel of A2 is affine A1. Um, and you get panel of A4 is affine A2. Um, and then there are these three versions of panel of A3 that go here. This is D2. Zero D one zero D Z zero hat. Um, so this is the perp of the standard diagram that the Japanese use. The point is that this is more the um, most singular fiber which occurs in the interior of the curve, and we understand how to extend the diagrams which occur here to spaces of arbitrary dimension. Um, whereas we don't know so much about the compactification divisors, and this matches up with the standard notation that people use for the, the ALE spaces. And so these are the spaces MB, which have these you know, quite complicated Hitchin type metrics. These spaces M star, um, these are often isomorphic to these ALE spaces, and these were constructed in general by Kronheimer and have a, a ADE classification. 
um, which is like this, except there's a lot more examples for arbitrary um, A in D. Um, and so we'd like to see that this space is an approximation to the full space which it occurs here, but that's unknown. Um, right, so I've really just um, sort of touched the surface, and I haven't talked about Stokes filtrations at all and how to pass between the Stokes filtrations and the Stokes automorphisms, which I spoke about, but um, that's described in this paper from March last year, um, and I think is reasonably well known. So perhaps I'll stop there. I think I'm probably out of time. Thank you. So your question is, because I have like, you know, affine D4 here, it should be related to the loop group of type D4. Yeah, that's kind of mysterious. There is a paper of Numi and Yamada, which has a lax pair for panel of A6, which is to do with like SO8 or spin 8. Um, but that's not known systematically. It's more that, you know, for me, D4 will be the, this picture. You know, the affine D4 graph will look like this, and you'll put this minimal imaginary root which has dimensions 2, 1, 1, 1, 1. And this says that you want to look at rank 2 bundles with four poles on the sphere. Um, and then we have the multiplicative version, which is like sort of converting that into a surface. And I understand how to extend that story to each of the rest of the graphs as well. All of the ones over here will be tame, and so they're to do with graphs which are stars, and the number of legs of the graph is the number of poles, so these will only have three, so, so th there's no isomonogamy deformations, and the rank is the number you put at the middle, so like six, uh, four, and three. Um, but that story can be extended to these also. So for instance, here you would have the square, and you can see how that square occurs when you look at this you know, additive symplectic quotient construction here. So we understood that back in sort of, you know, 2008, it's in this paper in the archive in 08 to 06. And more recently, we've understood how to relate the graph to like the presentation of the wild character space as well. That we can view, so for instance, the panel of A6, the, the, the panel of A2 space was this. This is affine A1, which should be like this. And we had this product of, you know, so H S6 down to S1 equals one. So there's really a quiver which occurs here. I've got this um, pair of nodes. The, you know, these are all automorphisms of a graded vector space, some vector space broken up into two pieces. H is a, a torus, so that's a loop like this and a loop like that. And then these six, I have three arrows in this d direction and three arrows back, and I'll represent each doubled arrow as a non-oriented arrow. So this space of data here is a representation of this quiver, and then I'm imposing a relation that this um, this two by two matrix has to be equal to, to, to one, so I'm subtracting off um, the quiver for just two by two, ben, ben, um, two, by two matrices, which um, is this, so I have a presentation, and I subtract off the relation, and I indeed get this. So one can see the affine Dinkin graph occur also, and we understand how to extend that story to arbitrary dimensions. Um, this was understood basically back here. I mean, it was conjectured for all of the untwisted cases in Appendix C there, and it was proved in the simply laced case that went on to become this simply 
based isomenotomy systems paper, um, and it was this statement that was proved in general by Hiroe and Jamakawa, but that didn't work for the Panda Bay 3 cases here. And we've recently understood how to do these, and the answer is that you end up with some nodes that have more relations than generators, and so you start to get negative loops. Um, so, for instance, the graph that we get for panel of A3 is like this, with one negative loop there, which we interpret as some version of the affine D2 graph. That, um, that is an expression of the g g g g generators and relations in a presentation of the, the panel of A3 wild character space. It's actually easier to work with it in the form of this um, degenerate panel of A5. But um, yeah, so we get this graph here, which is some type of the Cartan matrix looks like, you know, 2, 4, 2. So it has this 4 here, minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, minus 2. And the dimension vector is 1, 1, 1. Um, yeah, so that's a null root, if you will. Um, so we have an understanding, but not necessarily through loop groups. It's, it's more that... Um, Loop groups are about you know sort of what's happening at the pole, and we're doing this sort of perhaps more gl gl global picture about sort of you know actually doing gauge theory on the surface, and not so much just at a pole. We want to know, and it it's, it seems that these occur. I mean, that's sort of what the panel of a story is telling us that these spaces are attached to these graphs, and these can be understood in t terms of you know C two modulo the corresponding b binary group. Um, in the you know the Mackay uh, story, uh, the Mackay cosmos. The, the, the uh, kind of the KDD algorithm uh, in these times in the in the parameterizing the, the reverse one. Yeah. So you, then in, in presence theta we have the relation of the KDD times with the with root group. Right? Yes. Um, so the remark I'm making here is basically if you look in the Siegler and Wilson paper that they have this group, you know, X of, what is it, like A, T plus B, Z plus, uh, yeah, there's something like, I don't know, T, Z plus A, yeah, I don't know. Then there's a list of constants, so perhaps it's T2, T3, Z3 plus dot, dot, dot. Um, but if you work in a coordinate 1 over z, that is in the regular class of a connection. The Baker function is a solution of a irregular connection on a line bundle on the spectral curve. And so we're just looking at you know, irregular connections on vector bundles on curves. And so you specialize to the case of the rank 1. You know, a special case of that is the Baker function when the global monogamy is trivial and you j j just have st structure at the pole. So there's no Stokes data or monogamy and you get an actual function. And it turns out that when you vary the irregular class, then those functions behave in an, a nice way and you can differentiate with respect to the coefficients, the irregular class gives you a solution of KDV or KP or what have you. But that's a way to you know, interpret what they do as a special case of this general isomonogamy story. Um, if you want to. That's, uh, okay, let's thank Philip for the great